Hello, my name is Dr. Omide, and I'm going to discuss the thoracic diaphragm in this um, lecture. So we'll begin. The thoracic diaphragm is a muscular tendinous partition that separates the, uh, the thoracic and abdominal cavities. So it's usually convex superiorly towards the thoracic cavity and concave inferiorly towards the abdominal cavity. Remember, it's the chief muscle of inspiration. So um, it plays a major role during inspiration, whereby as you breathe um, in, it descends, and during expiration, it's actually a, a passive um, participant. So the central part of the diaphragm is what moves. So usually it forms a dome where the convex convexity is towards the thoracic cavity. So the periphery of the diaphragm is fixed okay it's fixed onto the thoracic cage and superior lumbar vertebrae so this is the thoracic diaphragm convexities on the thoracic cavity concavity in the abdomen and you can appreciate the domes and the attachment onto the vertebra so this just shows you a cross section through the region where the thoracic vertebra is and the structure that um, perforate the diaphragm the aorta esophagus and the inferior vena cover they have apertures on the on the diaphragm, then this uh, central tendon of the diaphragm, and this is where the heart sits in the pericardium. Then, so the pericardium is at the central part. It's slightly, that portion where the pericardium bleeds is slightly depressed, and the diaphragm curves superiorly to form right and left dome, but remember the right one is higher because of the position of the liver on the right. So what happens during expiration? The dome will reach the fifth rib so it goes upwards up to the level of the fifth rib that's on the right and on the left to the level of the fifth intercostal space so um the level of the domes of the diaphragm usually vary depending on various parameters such as phase of respiration so whereby in expiration the it's dome shaped yeah and it we've said it reaches fifth rib to fifth and fifth intercostal space on the left then posture also gives a variation in the level where the dome of the diaphragm is, as well as distension and size of the abdominal viscera. So all these determine um, the level at which the domes of the diaphragm are within the thoracic cavity. So the diaphragm is muscular and um, the periphery, uh, the central part is tendinous, then the periphery is muscular. So these muscle fibers actually converge to form that central tendon. So the central tendon has no bony attachments and it's divided into three leaves that resemble a clover leaf and lies at the center of the diaphragm. So near the center, um, you'll find that it's closer to the anterior part of the thorax. So the diaphragm has various um, openings. For example, the vena cava opening for the inferior vena cava and this usually perforates the central tendon and allows the inferior vena cover to enter the heart. The muscles of the diaphragm are based on the peripheral attachment. So you have a sternal part that inserts onto the xiphoid process, the costal part onto the inferior six costal cartilages and ribs, while the costal, uh, this costal part actually forms the domes of the diaphragm. Then the third part is the lumbar part that forms medial and lateral cruciate ligaments and uh, which um, insert onto L1 to L3 vertebrae. So these insertions of the ligaments, they actually form what you call right and left crura of the diaphragm, which usually ascend towards the central dome. So this is what we are referring to. If you look here, you can appreciate the median acute ligament. Okay. Sorry, the median acute ligament here. Then this is medial and lateral acute ligament. And if you were to check very well, this is actually your diaphragm. So this medial one is close to the psoas major and the lateral one is um, in proximity to the quadratus lumborum muscle. Again, this shows you the medial acute ligament, the lateral ligament, look at your quadratus lumborum and the psoas muscle here. So the crura of the diaphragm are muscular tendinous. They originate on the anterior surfaces of L1 to L3 bodies and also on the anterior longitudinal ligaments and the IV discs between L1 and L3. So the 
right cruise of the diaphragm is actually larger and longer than the left. It originates from either L1 or L uh, to L4 and inserts onto L3, L4, but the left originates from L1 and inserts to L2, L3. So the right cruise is what forms the esophageal hiatus. The left one lies on the left of the midline. So we, the aortic hiatus, the aperture for the aorta is formed by right and left cruise and a fibrous median acute ligament that unites them. So the acute ligaments are actually the lumbar parts of the diaphragm, as we had said. The lumbar parts of the diaphragm attach, are attached onto them. So they are actually thickenings of fascia that cover the muscles, which I already showed you. So psoas major is covered by acute lig uh, medial acute ligament, while quadratus lamborum is covered by the lateral acute ligament. So remember, quadratus lamborum is from L12, um, T12 transverse processes, the 12 transverse processes of uh, the tip of the 12th, sorry, the psoas major spans between um, lumbar vertebral bodies and tip of transverse process of L1, while quadratus lumborum continues from T12 transverse process to the tip of the 12th rib. So the central tendon of diaphragm, we said it's the thin aponeurotic part of the uh, diaphragm that has no bony attachment, so the superior part is fused with inferior surface of the pericardium, as I showed you. So the, it's mo mostly the fibrous part of the pericardium, the outer part, which is strong. Okay, so this is your central um, tendon of the diaphragm, that's the position. And so what's the blood supply of the diaphragm? Superiorly, you have internal thoracic artery that gives pericardiophrenic and musculophrenic vessels, branches, supplying superior surface of the diaphragm. You also have some um, contributions from the thoracic aorta that gives superior phrenic arteries. The inferior surface of the diaphragm receives inferior phrenic arteries and these are first branches of the abdominal aorta. However, they can also arise from the celiac trunk, which is from the abdominal aorta. So this diagram just shows you the blood supply to the thoracic diaphragm. You can appreciate the celiac trunk here, the left phrenic artery and the right phrenic artery giving branches to the different parts of the diaphragm. The venous drainage of the diaphragm again is based on the surfaces. So the superior surface is by internal thoracic uh, vein <laughs> via its tributaries, pericardiophrenic and musculophrenic. Then on the right side, superior phrenic vein drains into inferior vena cava. And the posterior curvature of the diaphragm drains into the azygous and hemiazygous veins. Now, when you come to the inferior surface of the diaphragm, what is the venous drainage? So you have inferior phrenic veins on the right and the left side. So on the right, uh, drain into inferior vena cover. On the left, there are two left inferior phrenic veins. So one that passes anterior to the esophageal hiatus drains into the inferior vena cover, and the other one, that, uh, which is a posterior branch, drains into the left suprarenal vein. What's the lymphatic drainage of the thoracic um, diaphragm? So the, um, the thoracic surface, which is a superior surface, drains, um, has anterior and posterior lymphatics. So and from the anterior part of the thoracic surface and posterior part, they drain into parastanal, posterior mediastinal, and phrenic lymph nodes, while the abdominal surface of the diaphragm, which is the inferior surface, drains into anterior diaphragmatic nodes, phrenic nodes, and superior lumbar nodes, which are actually... Um, cable or paraaortic lymph nodes. So what's the innervation of the diaphragm? Motor supply is by phrenic nerve, which is root value C3 to C5, while sensory supply is um, on the central part by phrenic nerve and the periphery by intercostal nerves, which are root, roots T5 to T11 and the subcostal nerve that has a root value of T12. So you have different apertures of the diaphragm. You have the vena cava on the central tendon, and it allows inferior vena cava, right phrenic nerve, and lymphatics from the liver to the middle phrenic and mediastinal lymph nodes. So this cable opening is actually at T8, T9 junction at the right of the median plane at the junction of the tendons, right and middle leaves. So um, when the diaphragm contracts during inspiration, what happens? The cable opening widens and dilates the inferior vena cava. So you're able to allow blood flow through the uh, inferior vena cava to the heart. 
So this is the cable opening within the central tendon at T8, T9 vertebral junction. Then we have an esophageal hiatus, which is oval at the right cruise of the diaphragm. It's at the level of T10 vertebra, and it's usually superior and to the left to the aortic aperture. So what are the four structures within that are transmitted through esophageal hiatus? We have esophagus, the vagal tracts, anterior and posterior, esophageal branches of left gastric vessels, as well as lymphatic vessels. So um, these uh, fibers of the right cruise of the diaphragm, they can decussate inferior to the hiatus, and this form the muscular esophageal sphincter. So remember, this sphincter constricts when the diaphragm contracts. Then lastly, we have the aortic hiatus, that is at the posterior part of the diaphragm, between the crura of the diaphragm, um, posterior to the median arcuate ligament. So this is at T12 vertebra, and it transmits mainly three structures, the aorta, thoracic duct, azygous, uh, hemiazygous vein. So remember, the aorta really does not pierce the diaphragm, so the movement of the diaphragm will not affect the flow through it during respiration, unlike the inferior vena cover. So the inferior vena cover opening is at T8, esophageal is at T10, and aortic is at T12. So the inferior vena cover will allow, oh, hiatus will allow inferior vena cover, phrenic nerve. The esophageal hiatus allows esophagus, vagal trunks, and esophageal branches of left gastric artery. And aortic hiatus allow the aorta, thoracic ducts, azygous, and hemiazygous vein. So this just shows you the apertures vena cover, allowing right phrenic and inferior vena cover. And then we have the minor apertures with the splanchnic nerves, aortic hiatus here, allowing aorta, zygous, hemiazygous, and aortic uh, thoracic ducts, and esophageal hiatus right there. Remember, it's a T10, allowing esophagus, the vagal trunks, esophageal branches of left gastric arteries. So we have other smaller um, apertures in the sternal and coastal parts of the diaphragm that will allow superior epigastric vessels and the diaphragmatic uh, lymphatic vessels from diaphragmatic surface of the liver. So the action of the diaphragm is described in the lectures that are discussing the mechanisms of breathing. So you can go there and um, listen to the, uh, check the action of the diaphragm. So what are the applied anatomy aspects of the diaphragm? You can have referred pain from the diaphragm so since it's in a vetter sensory, is by phrenic nerve, so you get referred pain to the shoulder because that's where the, there is shared um, dermatomes from C3, C5. Then there, the, you can have rupture of the diaphragm, especially in trauma. So trauma uh, situations where you have increased intrathoracic or intraabdominal pressure may cause rupture of diaphragm. Then you can have a non-muscular area, which is called the lumbo-coastal triangle, between the coastal and lumbar parts of the diaphragm. So this area is formed by uh, fusion of superior and inferior fascias of the diaphragm. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia can occur. Uh, the posterior lateral defect of the diaphragm, we call it uh, the foramen of Bokdalek. You can have herniation, so viscera from the abdomen getting into the thorax. Then you can have um, sliding and paraesophageal hernias. These occur um, through the esophageal hiatus. So sliding will occur through the esophageal hiatus vertically upwards, so the cardio of the stomach moves to the thoracic cavity via the hiatus, while paraesophageal, the cardio of the stomach uh, and the, the fundus will move upwards but parallel to the esophagus. So this just shows rupture of the diaphragm on this side, so you can see this shadow here, this um, portion, you cannot appreciate the lung which are dark, so abdominal contents have come into the um, left uh, cavi thoracic side, the thoracic cavity on the left side. As you can see in this, this shows you congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So the diaphragm did not um, develop well. So you can see abdominal content herniating into the thoracic cavity, and that's why you can see the air bubbles from the bowel. Okay, this this means this is bowel within the left um, side of the thoracic cavity. This is the heart here. This is the lung. So these are the different types of hernia. This is normal. This is sliding. Cardiac has shifted up. This is paraesophageal. So it herniates parallel to the esophagus. Thank you very much.